have um, a distinguished speaker among us, uh, Lukman Ramza. He's a solution architect for AI and ML in Google Cloud. Um, he joined Google Cloud after acting as a CTO uh, for a series of uh, New York startups in education technology, AI, and speech recognition. Um, his PhD work in computer, uh, has been in computer science at um, UC San Diego, doing computer vision research at JPL in Machine Learning Systems Group. Um, as an undergrad at MIT in Cognitive Science and Computer Science, he worked on a multi-layer neural network before it was called deep learning. Um, his academic interests uh, have always centered on the intersection of cognitive science and computer science. So, as you can see, um, awesome. Um, we are honored to have you, uh, Lukman. Um, take it away. Everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, it is an honor to be here at this meetup event. Previous speakers uh, have all been very distinguished uh, people uh, in the in the um, in this world of machine learning and Google, and so I'm very honored to be uh, uh, counted among them. So uh, tonight's topic is optimizing TensorFlow models for serving. We're going to discuss um, the uh, technical infrastructure for serving, uh, how to serve TensorFlow models on Google Cloud in particular, and um, how uh, even more so to uh, make that process efficient and make those models go fast. Uh, so that we can uh, reduce the cost of our ML applications and uh, increase the utilization of the resources that are required. This work is based on a blog post that was published on Medium a month ago. So uh, almost all the information that I'm going to talk about tonight is also on this blog post if you want to go and read about it. Um, there's also <coughs> code available for uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about GitHub in the Google Cloud Platform organization under this project called TF Estimator Tutorials, which, by the way, has a bunch of other really cool, interesting stuff in it. This code is living in a, a subfolder of just one of the sections there, but I would encourage you to check that repository out. And it was also done in collaboration with Khalid Salama, who is also a solutions architect in Google Cloud, focused on machine learning. And so I want to make sure to call him out. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk about uh, goals and metrics for serving. Uh, you know what we are trying to uh, achieve here is to optimize serving, and so we need some metrics in order to quantify that optimization. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about model formats in TensorFlow. There are a lot of model formats in TensorFlow. In its short life, it's managed to accumulate several, and uh, this area of uh, serving. TensorFlow models um, involves, you know, having some deeper knowledge about what those model formats are, how uh, ultimately to load them using code and operate on them, and so on, and transform them. We'll talk about optimization tools that are uh, useful for this purpose. There are several tools present in the TensorFlow code base that can be used to optimize TensorFlow models. There are also <clears throat> facilities or uh, tools to optimize TensorFlow that are built into the TensorFlow runtime as well. Matter of fact, much of what we were talking about today should be in an ideal world done by the TensorFlow runtime automatically without you having to think about it. But uh, as we will see, that's not always the case. Uh, so it is very useful to understand the kinds of optimizations that are uh, at play here and, uh, and how to do them yourself. Uh, there are contexts in which uh, you need to be able to do that. Uh, we will talk about the various technical options for serving TensorFlow models. And then finally, I'll conclude with an example of a convolutional neural net uh, for the MNIST data set that demonstrates all of this stuff. Again, we should have time for Q&A. So uh, I, will, um, I will be happy to take questions during the talk if, uh, you, know, if you have them. Uh, but I, I also will leave some time at the end for Q&A. All right, let's dive right in. So um, here is uh, sort of how to frame the problem. It gave it, given a TensorFlow trained model, we would like to optimize the speed of prediction. That we mean for a single example that you 
gave to this uh, model for prediction optimize the time that it takes to perform that prediction. And uh, in general, uh, in, a, in a broader sense, we would like to optimize the throughput. So the number of examples or inputs per second that the system that's performing these, this serving can process. Also interested in, in some cases in decreasing model size. Model size has an impact in lots of things um, in, in many contexts. You care about the size of your model. For example, if you're you know, deploying models to the edge or to mobile devices, you would like those models to be as small as possible uh, so that they download as fast as possible, use as uh, little bandwidth as possible, uh, that they use the uh, smallest uh, memory footprint on the device. Uh, there are also cases where there are actual hard limitations that you run up against with respect to model size. So for example, if you're uh, using hardware acceleration to serve your models, uh, in many cases, the, uh, this is limited by the amount of memory on the GPU, uh, the, the acceleration device. Um, and uh, <laughs> in the cloud machine learning engine, which is one of the methods that we will talk about later for serving models, for example, there's a limit, a quota limit imposed on the model size. I think by default, it's something like 512 megabytes for model size. Now that's not a hard limit. You can uh, make a request and get that increased, but nonetheless, um, you know it's something that uh, you may run into. You may your, your model may end up being too big uh, to uh, accommodate this uh, whatever serving method that you're trying to achieve. So it's important to understand like what factors influence the size of your model, and you know if there's anything to do about it, what you can do about it. And this just kind of replicates what I just said about model size. Uh, so as you can see, uh, size does matter when we respect, uh, with respect to models. So uh, we, we, we should be aware of um, you know, what factors influence the size of our models and then you know, ultimately what we can do about it. And like I said, prediction speed, not just uh, important when we're talking about a serving a single example, because in the end, that, that's, a, that's a measure basically of the complexity of the model and the time that it takes to serve a single example will be related to the th throughput in the end. Um, it's a critical factor in the throughput. And um, in turn, that throughput is related to the amount of resources that you're going to use in order to serve your models, uh, which is then related to the amount of cost that you're going to expend to serve models. Um, and sm relatively small differences in that, <clears throat> in that speed or throughput can have a big impact in the ROI of your machine learning application, right? So if you can decrease the amount of resources necessary to serve your models by something you know, non-insignificant, say 5% or 10%, then this should correspondingly decrease the amount of cost that it requires to support your machine learning application, which you know, can have a big impact in uh, the ROI of that application. There's also many cases where prediction speed is kind of essential to the um, to the application itself, right? We, you know, in, in cases where we want to get the result back as fast as possible because it makes a difference in the user experience, right? So um, we care about prediction speed in general, and we want to make it as fast as possible. Prediction throughput, like I said, is related to prediction speed, but includes other factors such as being horizontal scaling, meaning you know how many you know uh, uh, parallel resources are you devoting to serving. Um, and how many examples can you process in parallel? Uh, obviously, network performance is going to have an impact on throughput. Um, things that aren't necessarily related to TensorFlow or to you know, machine learning at all. Uh, compute performance, of course, uh, including whether you're using hardware acceleration or not. And a bunch of other stuff that's sort of beyond our current scope. So today, we're really going to just focus on um, how to optimize a trained TensorFlow model, as I said, uh, to predict as fast as possible. Um, and of course, the other stuff matters, but um, you know that's beyond our current scope. So let's talk a little bit more about the TensorFlow model formats and how they are implicated in all of this. So um, there are more than what you see here. Um, here I'm showing two formats, the GraphDef and the saved model. You probably are familiar with the saved model if you've trained TensorFlow models because this is now the most common model format that, uh, you know, for example, when you train a model using an estimator 
uh, and you export that model, it's going to be exported as a saved model. The saved model actually includes a graph def plus a set of saved uh, weights, basically, as files in a folder structure. So a saved model is not a single file, it's a folder that contains the definition of your graph in this graph def format, and uh, in addition, some weights that are uh, in a separate uh, set of files that are merged together with that graph when you are load or when you're serving the model. The graph def is a uh, either text or binary file format that is uh, that uses the protobuf uh, file format or the protobuf data structure format, which you probably are familiar with. It's very ubiquitous across everything that Google does. Um, and so uh, it could be, again, either in text or in binary, uh, but it basically represents all of the, the node structure of your graph, right? So the TensorFlow, uh, any TensorFlow model can be expressed as a graph, and the graph def just really encodes the structure of that graph. So again, the save model consists of a graph def plus a set of weights. Actually, more accurate to say that the saved model includes what's called a metagraph. So uh, this is a graph def that includes some extra information about what we call the uh, serving signature of the model, which is the inputs and the outputs of the model. So a saved model is a metagraph plus a, bu a bunch of weights stored in separate files folder structure. This is all very important to know when we're trying to operate on these uh, models and try to optimize them because uh, we have to understand what the, uh, what the underlying data structures are. We'll talk about uh, several basic optimization techniques, including freezing the graph, pruning the graph, uh, something called constant folding, a, uh, an operation called folding batch norms, and uh, quantization. Uh, and there are actually many other kinds of optimizations that can be done. Uh, I've included a few of them here. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not going to go into gory detail about any of these, but um, these are good ones to know about for optimization techniques. And uh, as I mentioned, actually, there are components of the TensorFlow runtime, which we will talk about, that perform many of these optimizations as well. Tools that uh, we will use are... Um, really two main ones. There's, a gra there's something called the graph transform tool, which has been in the TensorFlow code base for some time. I mean, the world of TensorFlow, you know, eons, like since like 2016. Um, and that in the blog post and in the examples that I'm, that I'm going to cover is the main tool that we will use. However, there's another tool called Grappler that is present in the TensorFlow runtime that is performing a lot of these optimizations, again, for it should be in a theoretical sense for you automatically such that you don't have to think about it. Um, the reality is a little bit different than that. We'll talk more about uh, why that is the case. Uh, the graph transform tool, by the way, is a, a command line tool, uh, but it also has a Python interface. Grappler is basically a component of the TensorFlow runtime that uh, recently also um, got a command or a uh, Python uh, API associated with it as well. So you can call both of these things through Python code, which is what we will do here. Uh, but in the case of the GTT, the graph transform tool, there's also just a command line version of that that you can use. So um, in summary, the optimization process is this. We're gonna take a uh, saved model, which again is you know, by far the most common format that you probably are dealing with when, you're, when you've got a trained TensorFlow model that's been exported. We're gonna convert that into a graph def. Uh, and that, that process is called freezing the model, basically merging the weights of the, 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 that are saved out externally uh, with the graph uh, such that it now is uh, all contained in a single file. Why would we need to do that before we start optimizing? So, uh, the answer is that um, if you keep the weights separately, separate from the graph and you start operating on the graph, pruning it and changing it and optimizing it, then that structure that, that existed before in the weights is no longer gonna map back to the graph. And then you won't be able to load those weights 
back in. You might be, you know, removing nodes, you might be collapsing nodes together. Um, and so uh, effectively, if you don't do this, you will have a broken model. Uh, so really this uh, model freezing step is, a, is the first step in any optimization process. Uh, so that we are dealing with, uh, you know, a, a graph that uh, contains all of the weights kind of merged into the graph as opposed to stored separately. So that then when we operate on that graph, you know, again, pruning nodes and merging nodes together and changing the structure of the graph that uh, we don't structure now that, that no longer, you know, where the, where the weights and the graph don't have the same structure. Um, once we've done that, once we've frozen the model, then we can optimize the model by basically operating on that graph. Again, uh, doing all kinds of uh, operations that we'll talk about uh, to the graph that involve um, shrinking the graph size and making the graph more efficient and, and you know, such that it uh, contains fewer oper operations, optimizing it. And then once we've done that, <clears throat> we're gonna want to convert that back to a save model because in the end, the save model is what is the most useful model format. So if you're gonna be loading this model into a serving process like TensorFlow serving or cloud machine learning engine, it's gonna want a save model. Not the case that when you do that, you somehow re-export those weights out to separate files um, so that uh, you know, a saved model can, can consist of a graph file that has all of the weights merged into it and then just an empty set of directories that, that contain nothing. Uh, and TensorFlow is fine with that. Um, so, but, but we still need to add this metagraph information that I mentioned back uh, to uh, the graph def uh, to make it uh, from a, you know, to convert it from a graph def into a, a saved model graph. Um, but we don't need to re-export the weights, so the weights will still be merged into this. Uh, it'll still be a, cons a single file, basically, just in a save, a save model folder structure that has just this one file. Uh, in it that uh, that represents the model. Okay. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit more detail about freezing the model. Again, um, so this is basically t you know consists of uh, merging the weights into the graph, uh, giving you a single file. I mentioned that already. I covered that pretty well. So pruning is another optimization process that we'll talk about. That uh, essentially consists of you know a set of uh, operations that reduce the size of the graph, either removing extra nodes that are necessary, uh, we call, for example, identity nodes, meaning nodes that um, act like the multiplication of one, or you know, they're basically they're like no op nodes that don't do anything uh, to the to the graph, or don't do do don't affect the computation that's being performed by the graph. Um, other things that you know, operations that you might do in TensorFlow, like shuffling on a, a tensor of size one, or redu reduction of dimensions empty dimensions and things that happen in the course of model development or you know in the course of um, you know operating on your tensorflow model uh, that uh, the optimization process can eliminate uh, which then results in you know a smaller more efficient graph um, in addition a lot of the times when you're developing a graph in tensorflow through some of the apis there will be multiple output nodes uh, created Meaning, um, in an output node is basically a, a node of the graph that produces the answer, right? And so it's not always the case that you have one set of outputs for a TensorFlow graph. Sometimes you have multiple outputs. But uh, it's almost always the case that when you're actually using the graph, you only care about one of the outputs. Um, and so when you actually use the graph in a production context, then you want to make sure that none of those other output nodes are present in the graph because that's just extra computation that the graph is doing that is not necessary. So we want to make sure that we prove that we remove ex extra outputs. <clears throat> it's not always the case that you'll have these extra outputs, but there are some APIs that when you use them produce uh, multiple outputs. It's possible that when you you know define your graph, however you're doing that using a high level API, um, that you would get multiple output nodes. And so uh, this is one of the things that we have to, to prune. So uh, constant folding is, is basically um, in constant operations uh, that might be chained together uh, and just pre-computing pre them. Using batch norms is actually similar to this. So I, you, I don't know if, who's familiar with batch normalization. A few of you. So if, if you're not familiar with batch normalization, I would say you should be. Um, it's a uh, become, a, I, would, I would call it a sort of a, a uh, standard technique 
that uh, you know may have been like a research technique a couple of years ago, but by now uh, anybody who's doing you know uh, serious uh, deep learning uh, should be using batch norm inside their models. In fact, uh, as of I think TensorFlow 1.10, 1.10, they included batch normalization in the canned estimators of TensorFlow. Uh, so it's actually all built into the you know, if you're going to uh, specify a deep neural net using the, the DNN estimator classes, uh, you have the option to turn batch norm on. So again, it's almost always the case that you actually want to do batch norm. Uh, we won't, it's not really time to talk about that in detail, what batch norm is, but uh, trust me, if you're not using it and you have like a deep neural network or a convolutional neural net, you should be. Effectively, what it does is normalizes the activations of each layer as the, the layers uh, as those activation values propagate up through the model by looking at the statistics of the data, basically that, you know, uh, starting with the input data, namely the batches of, of, of data that are you're feeding into the model. But even as you go up through the layers, there's a computation that's being done so that, um, and by normalizing meaning, meaning like, you know, um, subtracting away the mean and, and centering those, those values. Uh, this turns out to make learning much easier and faster. And, um, but, but in the end, you're computing some st statistics on those inputs and, and on the values of those activations. And um, those statistics are pre-computed during training. They're not computed during prediction. So the statistics are computed as uh, you know, a mean and a standard deviation during the training process. And then they're embedded as constant values inside the network. And you can just um, merge those constant multiplications that are happening there into the graph itself. All right, so that's a lot of explanation about what using batch norm is, but um, it, it does give us the opportunity to talk about batch normalization and and uh, what it is and why you should know about it. I have a question. Yeah. Just uh, the, about uh, are you going to have two models, one for uh, only prediction and then the other as a sage model? Because if you're only doing Um, I, I guess the answer to the question is yes, uh, that, that we are explicitly doing operations to a model to prepare it for serving. And yeah, if you wanted to, um, say, do further training on that model, say incremental training or add more training, that yeah, you would not want to have this fused uh, optimized model. Instead, you would want to start with a model that, that still had the, the structure, the, the batch normalization structure in it. So yeah. Um, we're really talking about a process that we apply to models after they're trained uh, to prepare them for serving. Yeah. And it's like an exponentially average. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, I mean, it. it uh, you know, in other words, we're computing the statistics based upon an exponent an exponentially weighted average of the previous values. And again, you know, we, we don't need to go into gory detail about what batch norm is or how it works, but. Um, you should at least, uh, you know, the concept should, or the name should be familiar to you. Um, I, I, uh, I advise you, if you don't know what it is, you know, learn about it and learn how you, it, what you should know or what you should make sure is that it's, it's on uh, inside your model. Uh, hopefully the, um, the, uh, the frameworks, certainly Keras will do this for you as well as some of these uh, canned estimators. But, but for those of us that are building custom models, we have to explicitly include batch norm inside our uh, model definition. Normalization is uh, a, a quite a big topic in and of itself, but essentially refers to taking the weights inside a model and reducing the precision. So going from a 32-bit weight, in some cases a 64-bit weight, and reducing down to a 16-bit or an 8-bit weight. Uh, this does reduce the accuracy of the model in many cases, but um, not by much, and you get a really big boost in speed and performance by quantizing, and you get a much, much reduced model size as well, right? Because most of the size of a model is due to its weights, and so if you can reduce the amount of data that it takes to store those weights by a factor of four, uh, you get a much, much smaller model. So quantization is really uh, implicated in a lot of what we do with respect to model op optimization these days. 
again, um, at the time you don't have to really know about uh, the details of this. It's done for you, but there are, are cases uh, where you really have to understand quantization and how to apply it. Um, and if you do that, you can get really big boosts in, in performance, certainly in speed, but also in model size. Now, at, at a cost, by the way, of, of some uh, amount of accuracy. All right, so if you're going to apply quantization to your model, actually, really, this applies to all of the things that we talk about here. You should test before and after to make sure that nothing that you did changes your, you know, your uh, accuracy or the, you know, the, the uh, precision of your results, at least not in a way that, you know, makes your use case no longer valid. Um, again, th this is what kind of the uh, transformation looks like when you're doing quantization inside a graph. You're taking something that, um, you know, is a sort of a simple sequence of floating point operations. So here we have an input which is where a uh, ReLU activation function is being applied to it that produces an output. Um, and instead, because again, you're, you're reducing the precision and so you need to know what the uh, range is of that weight so that you can map it back. Uh, so you have to, to pre-compute, which the system will do for you or the, the optimization tools will do for you, the, the min and the max. Uh, then you reduce the precision, you perform the calculation, and then you map it back to the original floating point value. The folks heard about TensorFlow Lite? So this was a system introduced last year basically to optimize the uh, deployment of models, TensorFlow models on mobile devices. One of the key techniques that TensorFlow Lite is doing to make models work well and fast on mobile devices is quantizing down to eight bits. Uh, so in this case, TensorFlow Lite actually does all this quantization for you. You don't have to worry about it, uh, but uh, that is the secret sauce underneath. Uh, a lot of what TensorFlow Lite is doing is basically quantizing your model down to eight bit. A fair bit about uh, all the various optimizations. Let's look at in, in more detail at an example. Uh, we're just going to talk about a um, MNIST convolutional neural net, which is kind of a standard uh, neural net that you might deal with. Um, and this is the full optimization process that we will apply. Uh, first, we will run uh, predictions uh, so that we, you know, we know what the model output before we applied all of our optimizations, uh, and we know how fast it ran. All right, so we have to do that before, so that we have some kind of benchmark or baseline so that we know what effect our optimizations had. We also want to run predictions so that we can verify, as I said, uh, which we should always do, always do at the end, that we didn't break our model or do anything that, you know, um, that re reduced the precision of our model or broke the output. It's quite easy, frankly, to break your model <laughs> by doing this stuff to it, and so you want to make sure that you can verify that the model at the end of the process uh, still performs well, or at least you know, in, in an accurate way. Um, and then you also want to be able to quantify the effect of the optimizations, right? So you need to have a baseline benchmark at the beginning. Then you freeze the graph, you run the optimizations. Again, uh, we're going to show uh, this using the graph transform tool. But um, uh, there's also this uh, actually more advanced and more recent tool called Grappler that, that can also use uh, we convert that model uh, back to a save model format, and then we rerun the predictions to verify that we didn't break it, that it's still as accurate as we need it to be, and we also benchmark uh, at that point to quantify the effect of our optimizations. Um, let me just say a few words about ben benchmarking methodology. It could be a whole separate talk on that, but um, it's really important, I think, to be careful about how we benchmark. Uh, because if careful, then we may, you know, draw some incorrect in conclusions about what we just did. Uh, we may decide that, oh, these optimizations didn't work at all because it makes our, the prediction longer. Um, and so it's important to have some uh, consistent be benchmarking methodology and, and to pay attention to, to what we do here. Um, you know, in, uh, and again, um, like I said, I won't go into gory detail about this, but I just want to say that, you know, uh, the three desirable attributes of, of a benchmark are that it's repeatable, meaning that you get the same answer when you run it multiple times. Oftentimes, that's, it's, you know, because um, computers are a little bit indeterministic, frankly, um, uh, in, in, in sort of varying ways, um, you often won't get necessarily the same exact result. So we want, you know, when we say repeatable, we're not necessarily saying you get the exact same result, but it needs to be within a small 
sort of range. <laughs> needs to have low variance. Um, we want to run the benchmarks in a controlled environment, meaning you have to have a lot of control about all of the different components that we're testing. Uh, there, you know, if there's some part of that component that we don't control, say for example, the network, right? If you're running a benchmark across uh, from your laptop across the cloud uh, to, to something that's running in the cloud, um, you know, you've got a big chunk of stuff that you have no control over there between you and uh, what you're running. And we also want to make sure the benchmark has a limited focus, meaning it's only testing the things that we're interested in and not trying to test uh, lots of different things because, again, that sort of uh, reduces the amount of control that we have by definition. Um, you know, testing more things makes it more likely that there should be some part of that system. So again, I, um, that's all I want to say about that. Um, but uh, influences the choice of how we might decide to benchmark our model optimizations because there are multiple ways that we could do that, right? So one of them would be just to use pure Python. It's a very easy thing to do now, particularly with this contrib predictor module that was added to TensorFlow that allows you to perform predictions in Python. Now, of course, this is TensorFlow 1.0 that has the contrib package, which is going away. Uh, migrating. migrating. It's not going away, right? Yeah, so that's the wrong way to say it. Yeah, it's migrating to somewhere else where it will be still useful, <laughs> uh, still be able to be used. Anyway, that's a, that's a potential method. Cloud Machine Learning Engine Predict Service, uh, very useful, important service which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, later. Very, very useful for production prediction, right? You know, you can train your models on cloud machine learning engine, and then you can very easily take that same model and, and set up a predict service for it um, on the cloud. And then another option would be use TF serving, which is another serving option. Again, I will, I will actually talk a little bit more about all the various serving options uh, a little later using a, you know, just a REST call. So like basically running an instance of TF serving you know, in, a, in a container locally. Okay. These three, uh, can anybody say which is the best? <laughs> oh, the answer is TF serving locally. The, the Python method suffers from the fact that Python itself is sort of not a very controlled environment because it's uh, an interpreter that is doing a lot of things under the hood that you have no control over, like garbage collection. And um, it tends to just to be very in, uh, non-deterministic from run to run. If you try running your, your code on, uh, you know, using Python, even if you do, you know, a, a, like a, make it more statistically valid by doing bigger batches or like, you know, more predictions, you will find that the, uh, the results are quite variable. Um, I mean, this is, uh, you know, you could overcome this, right? You could run, you know, the, the benchmark 10 times and average the results, but you'd rather not have to do that. Cloud Machine Learning Engine, well, as, as, it's, as we said, you know, the, the, the challenge is to see you running something in the cloud and you're trying to uh, test that locally, even, or even if you're having an instance on the cloud that's, that's making calls out to Machine Learning Engine to do that predict, there's a lot of stuff there that you just have no control over. And Machine Learning Engine Predict is a managed service, so means it's handling a lot of the scaling issues for you. So in the middle of your benchmark run, it might, you know, see that your, you know, your load is spiking and try to allocate some more instances for you to do this prediction, which would then throw your benchmark results off completely and not be very repeatable. Uh, so not a great choice. Um, uh, running TF serving locally in a Docker container is actually quite controlled. Uh, and it should be quite consistent from run to run because, uh, and, you know, again, you're running it on your laptop, you've got a lot of other processes running at the same time and that could Im influence the result. But um, nonetheless, of all those op three options, it's it, uh, I would claim the best. And so that's the one that we used in the blog post. Uh, again, in the code that's out on GitHub, you will see all three options um, as examples. So you could you know, test each of them out. Um, and it's also just useful to have sample code that uses the contra predictor to do predictions, you may not even know that that existed. Uh, the cloud machine learning engine, you know, also useful to have an example of that. And then finally, the uh, uh, deploying and uh, you know using TF serving in a local container as well is also useful. I, I'm going to make a, a little diversion here quickly to talk about the various options for serving TensorFlow in a production environment. And we've talked about cloud machine learning engine, uh, the predict service thereof. It's a managed service. It's a lot of, a lot of great features for uh, doing prediction. A very easy transition from training to predict. Basically, 
in your training process you have at the end of it, you export the save model, and then uh, it's very easy to launch a predict service from that same save model. Um, you can do online predictions and batch predictions. It contains uh, facilities to do model versioning. It does support uh, other frameworks than TensorFlow now, so scikit-learn and XGBoost. And uh, I was asked by the product manager or the, the tech lead here to mention that very soon um, you'll be able to deploy predict on any machine type that's available in GCE. So you have a lot of uh, even more control over the kinds of machines that you're running on um, and also to harness GPUs. So really good option for, um, for deploying your models uh, and doing predictions. Again, if you're interested in a managed service, meaning you're, uh, you don't need to have like very strong control over the underlying architecture. Very good for, for uh, deploying your models to production. Not, not so great as a benchmarking tool necessarily. TF serving we talked about based on uh, a open source component from the TFX platform, which is Google's internal platform for uh, machine learning pipelines. Uh, which we are now open sourcing the components of, sort of like one after the other. I believe TF, I believe the serving component was the first component that was open sourced. Um, one of the nice things about TF serving is that it has the facility to uh, update the models dynamically, meaning it can be up and running, serving your you know examples, and then you swap in a new model under the hood. And TF Serving will automatically pick that up and just uh, uh, you know, seamlessly transition from the old model to the new one. There's a large community inside Google and outside Google that's using TF Serving. Um, I will say it's, uh, if you're using GPUs, it's, um, it is challenging to harness multiple GPUs using TF Serving. It can be done, but you have to encode the device assignments in the graph. And, and so that's one, I would say, drawback of TF Serving. If you really have stringent uh, throughput requirements for your serving application, and you really need to have, you know, uh, running on machines that have, you know, uh, four or eight GPUs attached with them, uh, then uh, it, it's a challenging thing to do with TF serving. Uh, the architecture for a, a serving uh, system in production sort of looks like this, where uh, you typically would deploy TF serving inside a Kubernetes cluster, where uh, each node has its own instance of TF serving. And then you have some kind of uh, load balancer in front that uh, is distributing those serving requests across the nodes. There's a thing option from our partner NVIDIA called NVIDIA Inference Server, which includes the capability to harness something called TensorRT, which I'll just I'll talk about a little more. Um, that basically harnesses some of the uh, capabilities of uh, the newer the newer NVIDIA GPUs. They have something called a Tensor Core unit inside them. So actually this, um, this tensor core unit that is used under TensorRT is basically harnessing quantization. So under the hood, it's converting your weights into 16 bit and it's got um, hardware acceleration that's really, really fast for processing these, uh, with these weights. Uh, this feature is present in the V100 and uh, the, the new P4, which we just announced publicly, uh, that's available on Google Cloud for serving. It's a uh, few core that's really specialized to serving. So it doesn't have a lot of onboard memory, uh, but it's really fast and cheap or cheaper than uh, some of the other options for doing serving. Uh, it's also, like I said, present in the V100. Okay, so back to the optimi optimization process. Talked about running predictions and, and benchmarking the, the baseline. I think I actually had a number up there that was like 189 seconds for this particular uh, sort of MNIST CNN, kind of simple MNIST CNN, which is the, basically, I think, a thousand executions uh, uh, of uh, a batch size of 100. This is what uh, it looks like to freeze the graph. I said we're calling this freeze graph, graph operation using the Python API, uh, which is present in the Python tools module under TensorFlow. This freeze graph uh, tool can be called directly here. It actually has um, one of the largest set of arguments of any method call that I've seen in TensorFlow. It's, I didn't put all of them here, so it's like 10 more uh, that are required. Like you can't even, they're not even optional. Um, but anyway, the sample code shows you how to do this. Um, and that the output is basically a, uh, you're pro providing the output graph file name, and so it actually writes the output graph, the frozen output graph for you when it completes. 
So this is what running the optimizations using the graph transform tool looks like. <clears throat> Again, you give it a list of the transforms that you want to run. Uh, then you run this transform graph method and uh, it uh, produces the optimized graph as the output. Uh, then you have to actually go save that graph. Uh, but again, the sample code shows you how to do all that. Um, and then finally, um, you want to convert back to save model. This turns out to be kind of unwieldy and harder than you'd like it to be. But uh, you basically, if you know the right APIs to call, it's not that bad. Uh, you use um, the uh, TF saved model simple save method. Um, and uh, again, you have to provide the inputs and a list of inputs and the list of outputs that you want to save. And so you have to actually know that or know what those nodes are. Uh, in this example code, we found the inputs by just looking for placeholder nodes, which essentially are you know, typically what uh, would provide the inputs to a graph. And, uh, we got the outputs using uh, actually by looking at the metagraph def, as I talked about, like the metagraph def includes the signature that, that gives a list of the output nodes. And so um, that's where that came from. Um, and then um, the benchmark again, after applying these set of optimizations, and uh, instead of 189 seconds, it takes 162 seconds. So that's about a 15% improvement, uh, which is not bad for just running a few optimizations. And it's actually significant enough that it would, you know, could make a difference in cost and speed, certainly, uh, that, uh, a difference that you would care about. And each of the optimizations that we perform should preserve the the output for a given input. In other words, hopefully, again, this is something we have to verify, but uh, there shouldn't be anything that we did that would change the output for a given input. Yeah. Actually, we didn't do quantization, uh, this one, uh, uh, but uh, sorry. Yes. So TensorRT actually only makes sense if you're doing it on GPU. Um, in fact, really by definition, what it is is preparing your model so that it, will, it is able to harness those tensor cores that are built into the V100 and the V4. Uh, and I think all of the, the GPUs going forward from NVIDIA, or most of them, will, will include this special unit. Um, TensorRT is a kind of a, a topic in and of itself. Uh, we could talk a little bit about that. There is sample code out there that shows you how to, to apply TensorRT. Again, it's been present inside the TensorFlow code base since, um, you know, I think March of last year, like uh, as of like 1.7. Um, so it's reasonably stable, uh, but you also need to use the NVIDIA inference server in order to harness it. Having said that, um, if you really want like really high performing serving, uh, it's pretty much the way to go. Have, I also would say you probably would need to engage with NVIDIA <laughs> in order to make it work. Uh, it's, it's complicated to get it to work. Um, we're just about to publish a, uh, actually so there's already been a blog post that shows you how to do this on V100s. Just about to publish um, uh, another blog post that uh, shows you how to do it using the P4s. So you'll have sample code out there available if you're interested in doing this. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, it, it, it's something that uh, you probably need the help. You probably need end up need some technical help in order to, to pull it off. Um, I, you know, over the course of this year, I'm sure the NVIDIA, the NVIDIA inference server will get more stable and, and uh, more robust. There are some other things to say about the NVIDIA inference server. Um, it's not dynamic actually yet, like TF serving is, which is a problem. Almost every practical ML application is dynamic in some sense, meaning you know, you don't ever, almost never train a model on static data and then just serve it, you know, kind of ad infinitum. Typically, you're going to update that model based on new data at some point. And so um, the process of deploying the new model gets much more complicated, right? Because you have to, uh, you have, to um, have your own system for like doing this hot swap Right? Or you have to be able to bring the model, bring the whole server down, and, and then you know swap in a new model and bring it back up, or you know uh, something more complicated where you you know you uh, migrate traffic over from you know you deploy a new instance and you migrate. So anyway, there's a reason why TF serving is dynamic is because it's actually kind of a pain when the serving in, uh, infrastructure is not dynamic. Well, what did you do? You said you're coming to integrate. 
those other optimizations that we performed did make a difference, right? So we, we still, um, let's go back. This is the list that we talked about that we were going to do. So this uh, removing identity nodes, uh, folding constants, merging duplicate nodes actually is kind of a um, form of pruning or uh, you have, you know, uh, two nodes that are in succession that, that, uh, that do the same operation. Stripping unused nodes, meaning um, any nodes that are not, um, that are being calculated but are, are not actually connected to the output, right? So that would include extra output nodes, but also just like any, there are, there are oftentimes nodes in your graph that, that end up getting added that are, are, you know, not, that don't, there's no edge from that node back to, to the output, and so those nodes get pruned. And then there's folding batch norms, uh, which we talked about as well. So those are the, the that's the set of transforms that we did. Um, which ones are defaults, or which ones do you have to do with <clears throat> So this is a good topic. It actually kind of leads me to uh, the sort of the, the, the uh, conclusion of the talk, uh, which is that the, the truth is that Grappler, which I mentioned, which is built into the TensorFlow runtime, is actually performing all of those optimizations that we listed. And TF serving, which is the serving mechanism that we used, uses Grappler. Uh, but we still see the results that we see. We see them consistently across multiple models. We actually implemented this using uh, vanilla TensorFlow and Keras, and all of that code, sample code, is in our repo. Um, and yet we see this performance increase. I've been talking to the folks that, uh, uh, both on the TF serving side and the grappler side to try to understand why this is the case, but it kind of highlights the fact that um, you need to take control <laughs> of the, uh, you know, of your serving. If you care about performance, um, you know, you should not rely necessarily on everything, you know, working perfectly under the hood. I mean, you would like to, but the reality is, is that for some reason, and I, we're not sure, I'm still not sure uh, why this, why Grappler is not performing in the way that it's supposed to in this context. But nonetheless, it's, it's uh, very reproducible. Um, for some reason, the Grappler optimizations that are supposed to be happening inside TensorFlow Serving are not happening. Um, so again, in an ideal world, this, um, this set of optimizations for most cases, uh, if you're using TF serving, should not be necessary. Now, there are some cases where um, you're doing, uh, you know, uh, another kind of serving mechanism that you can't rely on Grappler kicking in. And so this is a good, useful knowledge to have. Uh, but the, also the reality is, is that despite Grappler supposed to be doing, uh, performing these optimizations uh, in the test that we ran, it was not. And, and again, we'll figure out why that is. Um, you know, as you know, uh, TensorFlow uh, is a very rapidly evolving system and, you know, things don't always work perfectly. And so you should take control over your own uh, model process, particularly if, it, uh, if there could be a 15% difference in your performance. Um, and, and understanding all of these processes and, and how to test them um, is, is, is important. But uh, the reality is, is again, I think what, at this, this, we discovered this after we published the post in November that actually Grappler is supposed to be do, applying all these optimizations. And because TF serving uses Grappler, uh, that it, this, these, these optimizations shouldn't work, but they do. And so something's wacky. Again, maybe it's something that we're doing, I don't know, but um, you know, we, we uh, repeated these, and like I said, we did it on more than just one model, we did it using multiple APIs, and we were, it was very consistent that we saw about this 15% improvement. So, um, yeah, I don't have all the answers here, I don't know exactly what's going on, um, but uh, anyway, this was, uh, I think, still a, a useful exercise in understanding you know, the details of the model formats and the optimization processes and things like quantization, which we didn't do here, but um, can be a you know, really important factor in, in uh, your, the efficiency of your serving processes as well. Okay, uh, so that's, that's uh, the end here. Again, uh, we've had lots of questions, uh, great, really great questions during the talk, but if anybody else has any more questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them now. Sort of report on what, to which extent what of 
optimization operation was performed in the sense so it can still ex it can still uh, show me that interpretability of the model or maybe explainability of the model is still rooting from the same sources for example what i'm trying to say if i say this image of the cat is of particular type of cat because it has red nose so what i'm trying to say uh, like would that would would what we're doing here change so that like maybe to what extent it has up, changed or updated the explainability of the model or the or the results are being rooted from the same mathematical causes right that's a good question so uh, the whole topic of explainability, maybe come, I'll come back someday and give a talk about that. I've actually been working on that myself. Uh, very, very hard, but interesting topic in the world of ML these days. Lots of people are interested in it. Um, I mean, the short answer is what, we're do, what we did here should not change the mathematical uh, uh, result of the model, meaning none of the optimizations that we did here should change the mathematical results. Uh, that are computed by the graph. But again, you have to test that. Don't believe me, right? You know, that's why I said run the predictions on a test set. In the, in the case of MNIST, it's the MNIST data set, right? And then run it again and make sure that your outputs look the same uh, for, for a given input. It's, you know, this is not that hard to do. Uh, there's only 60,000 examples in the MNIST data set. So you should really verify that the numerical output for a given input is the same. But the, the, the truth is, is all the optimizations that are performed here should not have changed the mathematical calculations that are being performed by the graph. Interpretation is another big topic that, uh, uh, we, you know, unfortunately probably don't have time to talk about much to, today, but uh, maybe I'll come back and talk about that later. Just yeah. Uh, have we created the benchmark numbers on various uh, architectures, for example, that's like 35, 34, 50? Yeah. The, the absolute value, the, the values of these benchmarks will definitely change uh, according to the model. Um, and they will also, the absolute values will change depending on which system you run on. But, but the key thing we're looking for is, are they consistent on a, for a given model on a given machine, are they consistent from run to run? And the method that I, I talked about here today uh, in, in, uh, empirically is uh, quite consistent. And that was yeah. more less than 34. Uh, no, no, it was, uh, this is uh, just a, a, a CNN that we created that's just a few, a, a, a few layers, you know, very simple CNN to do on this. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, my pleasure, no problem. Which of these models, uh, the stand models like Inception, ResNet, have the most amount of uh, errors compared to the other models? Like, uh, which one has the most amount of compression? Of layers? Yeah, or, no, I mean, in terms of when you, uh, when you do the TF serving, you, you get a smaller model, right? Oh, um, yeah, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on this, the, what's, how the model is constructed and what operations are being used. Uh, you know, these, these big, deep uh, CNNs that they use to do uh, image recognition, again, like ResNet or Inception, uh, are actually quite complex from an architectural standpoint if you look down um, in, in the details of how they're constructed. Which ones are compressed the most, or which ones get? Uh, um, yeah, I couldn't answer that. Uh, yeah, um, I haven't done a, I haven't actually done a, uh, a comparative survey. But uh, yeah. So the fourteen percent reduction in your model size. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that after that fifteen percent reduction, I get the same accuracy? It should. So yes. Oh no, it, it, there's nothing that we could do here that would make your model more accurate. There are definitely things we could do that would make it less. Less accurate? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, for, for a given accuracy, I mean, again, if you're processing medical image, imagery, you probably do care about the throughput and the prediction speed, right? Because 
those are very big, you know, big images and the models that you're using probably are quite big as well. And so it can make a big difference in the amount of time that it takes uh, or the cost. Um, so, I mean, these optimizations make sense. Although, like, again, theoretically, you shouldn't have to perform them in, in, in many cases. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, we're actually not here concerned with optimizing accuracy. That's, that's the, the realm of training. You know, like that's the whole, um, you know, the whole world of making um, your models as, as accurate as possible is this world of training, which, you know, people talk about a lot, right? I mean, they talk about how to optimize training and how to distribute training and how to make training go fast. Uh, you don't see as many people talking about optimize serving. Uh, that was one of the motivations that we had for doing this work. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yep. Yes. Okay, so that there's no uh, coding changes? Uh, there are coding changes, but hopefully not too, too invasive, yeah, not too extensive. If you're using the estimator API, then it's actually pretty minimal. Um, and I, I don't know about Keras yet with respect to TPUs. Is it a... So we don't have TCP support for 2.0 yet, um, but for CFL, Keras will be available in the original 1.0. Okay. Also, if you want to try out using TPUs for free, um, you can do that with colab.research.google.com. That's right. Yeah. I, I, should, but I, should, I couldn't ever believe how we would expose to the outside world a, a TPU for, uh, free. for free. I know. Uh, somehow we managed to do that. But yeah. Um, yeah, you would figure some Bitcoin miners would have figured out how to take advantage of that somehow <laughs> by now. <clears throat> Yeah, so if you go look on the um, documentation for this graph transform tool, there are actually um, lots of parameters and ways that you can adjust or you know, opt opt optional transforms that you could perform um, that uh, you know, may be more aggressive. Um, you know, we don't have the, the time to talk about all of that here, but uh, yeah, I mean, there are, there are some uh, you know, more um, experimental transforms as well that can be performed that have you know, a greater likelihood of changing your results or potentially not working with your graph. Um, so yeah, uh, this world of transforms is actually quite deep and rich um, when, you, when you dig into it. Um, and again, you know, hopefully most of the time, in most contexts, uh, you wouldn't have to, to know all this stuff because the TensorFlow runtime is doing it for you. But you know, uh, as we saw here, you know, it's, it's useful to know because maybe something went wrong and the TensorFlow runtime isn't working correctly or TF serving is not working correctly. And, uh, and, or, or that you may not be using, you may not be using TF serving. Like maybe, uh, you know, I have um, big applications that were in IoT where uh, people are running predictions on an edge device or even like a Raspberry Pi where there's, you're not gonna be able to get TF serving on that uh, device. And so uh, it's good to know how to do this kind of stuff. Um, also, just to understand better, for example, what frameworks like TF Lite, TensorFlow Lite are doing under the hood to optimize your graphs. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very, a very interesting deep world, uh, most of which is happening kind of under the hood and, you know, you don't uh, hear about it, but uh, we're, we're hoping to uh, expose some of this information to the public as part of this work. Thank you.